welcome back to our second episode with Kia Sterling. I'm telling you, she is a renowned celebrity runway artist, and she has broken every barrier and still breaking barriers in this industry. And today, we are going to continue our conversation with the beauty industry behind the chair. She already told us about being behind the scenes of, you know, doing celebrity runways, um, fashion shows, and traveling the world, Europe, and all that stuff, and being a part of phenomenal teams um, for, you know, for that platform, Fashion Week, and all of that. Now we're going to talk about just being behind the chair. So, Kia, let me ask you, you love being behind the chair. You love being behind the chair. And so just tell me the difference, like being in the salon with your customers, with your coworkers, and how does that um, make you feel today? Like just being behind the chair, still working on your customers, and just still being in the industry um, as just a stylist, putting up, putting the superstar, because you're a superstar, putting the superstar status to the side, but just being a, a stylist with hair care, coloring, and just servicing your customers. Well, I, I mean, I love it. The one thing that I love about working behind the chair is that it's real. You're dealing with real women, real men who have real issues. And I like to call myself like a, um, a, a, a chameleon. I like to change people's image. I like for someone to come in with long dark hair and they walk out with a blind pixie. So I think what, what makes my job the most fun is that you can change somebody's entire life by changing their hair. You can change, the, I mean, you can be sad, you can be going through, Whatever's going on in your life, once you change this hair and you become a new person. So I I look forward to that every day. And I love hair care. I love to make women feel good. I love to make men feel good because when you get your hair done, I don't care what else is going on. Hair is the first thing you see when you see someone and it's so important. Hair is energy. Yeah. So I always tell people like, we need to do something with your hair because it's going right. to change up. So right. that is it's, the biggest thing. And I'm helping people. Yeah. So, yeah. And so we was talking about how, you know, back in the day, um, we, we, we around the same age, <laughs> how insane we were, you know, uh, can you tell my audience a little bit about our past being behind the chair and how we worked harder than smarter? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my God. Back in the nineties. Let's go on back a little bit. Let's go back like 25 years, 20 years. Back in the nineties, what the hairstylists do. And I believe this is hairstylists all over, especially black hairstylists. Okay. We worked all the time. We worked from eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning till two, three, four in the morning. Sometimes five, I've worked until six. Don't even ask me to. why. I, I have to. <laughs> but they come right back, get an hour sleep, get something to eat. And come. That was just, I think what it is, I had a conversation with someone the other day and we were talking about how it's part of the culture. Okay. So it's not even something that we look as look at it as not being right. Like it's just what we do or what we did. Cause I don't think we do that anymore. No. Um, right. Back in the 90s, it was a big thing. You know, it was like we were afraid to leave our clients because we swore somebody was going to steal her. <laughs> um, we were afraid to, um, uh, we were afraid to leave. I don't know what it was. It was like, do we need beds in the back or something? Like we were, <laughs> I remember every salon I worked in and even driving by salons, it was like, you weren't a top stylist if you weren't still working at 11 o'clock. Yeah. Midnight, you just weren't. And as I, you know, evolved in the industry, after, and I think a lot of, I think what happens is a lot of black stylists that I know, they've gotten burned out. Yeah. And part of it is because of that. And we weren't taught differently. You know, when you work at a like really dope salon in Philly or other states, other cities, but it's part of the culture that this is, you come out of school, you become an assistant, you assist and you get a chair and then you work like, you're crazy. 
for the next however. But what happened with me was I just kept saying this doesn't even at one one day a light bulb went off and I was like, this makes no sense to me. Okay. Like I'm I'm it's just not making sense. I work all the time. We know hairstyles, we miss, we miss the cookouts, we miss the the sweet 16 dinners, the, the, wedding, the, the funeral, the whatever. We miss it all because we behind the chair 20, 20 19 hours of the day. <laughs> Four hours, and I know a lot of my black stylists. <laughs> feel you know what, can you know? I'm really starting to think that it was a Philly thing, because when I talk to other stylists and stuff, and I be saying what you just said, they looking at me like we ain't do that. We work smarter. Maybe it was a Philly thing. I think <laughs> it was our mentors. But I do know for a fact it was a black stylist thing. Yes, like, of course. And but I do know stylists that like my friends in New York and DC they work like that. Okay, okay. I, East Coast thing. I'm not sure, but I knew something was wrong with this picture, and I said I got to change the channel. Yeah, yeah. And what I realized is that you know about ten years ago when I started branching out and working with um you know working in different cities and um white stylists and white salon owners, you know, started talking to them and they were like, girl, no, we don't do that. You can't do that. You need to work smarter, not harder. And I'm like, oh, you, you, you gotta bring more value so you can increase your price so you don't have to work like that. And I'm like, oh, okay. So that's when I said, all right, it's time to educate myself. So that's when I just started really jumping in taking a lot of business classes. Okay. A lot of classes on um, uh, customer service, customer experience, um, just the whole nine. Because what, what we do learn as black stylists, we learn the technical part. Now, I'm going all the way back to the 90s. I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about back then. Right. We, were so, we learned the technical part. We would jump in a color class in a minute, a cut class, a weave class. But if you really think about it, how many black stylists really jumped in business classes? And I'm not talking about going to community college for a business course. Right. I'm talking about business in this industry. So someone that is, you know, like, like a Sam V, let's just name him. I'm just naming him because he popped in my head. But somebody has a really big name in the hair industry that actually teaches that. It teaches hairdressers how to work smarter, not harder. Because when you take the business class at community, they're not really teaching you that. Right. You know what I mean? You need to be specific. So once I got introduced to that, I had to reevaluate everything I was doing. I was like, this makes no sense, okay. but this makes sense. Okay. You know, I even had the wrong type of clients. Hmm. I learned all these things through educating myself. Now, when you say you had the wrong type of clients, can you explain to my audience what you mean by that? I had the client who... Um, was looking for more or less uh, a bargain <laughs> as opposed to value. Huge difference. And the person that's looking for value um, shops at Neiman Marcus, shops at uh, Sex, shops at uh, Bloomingdale's. The person that looks for the bargain is shopping at, you know, uh, your Forever 21 or your H and M. I don't have anything against those stores. Right. I like them. I like Forever Twenty One, but I'm a person who really appreciates value. Okay. So I knew that I had to, like, I literally had to start over, and it's frightening. Yeah. To, it's terrifying, but I knew I had to start over because I'm not bringing the value that I need. And at this point in the game, this client doesn't understand the language I'm talking at this point. Can I ask you a question? Why mm -hmm. do you think African American people are customers? Now, Kia, we could say t 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, because we still got clients that still with us from each, you know, decade segment of those, right, <laughs> decade of, yeah. Not our age, but whatever. <laughs> Why do they think that? Our prices are not supposed to go up. Well, see, th that's what I mean by- It's our fault, right? 
it's it's our fault. And I I really believe that every like twenty years ago, I didn't know this, but I've educated myself. I know a lot now. I know every client's not meant to sit in my chair. Okay, I'm cool with that, and I understand that because some clients, again, they you know most black hairstylists, not all of us, but most black hairstylists started off doing hair in their kitchen. You know, not everybody, but I know I did, and I know a lot of people who did. Um, so if you if you're going to somebody's kitchen and they're 17 years old doing your hair, how much value are you really putting on that if you're leaning over a sink? So okay. it's the same mentality that this person has once you even move into a salon. So the you know, hair is just a big part of the black culture and it's kind of like my cousin braids my hair, my sister braids my hair. You know, we don't always look at black hairstylists as valuable. You know, we'll look at our doctor, our lawyer, our maybe our maybe our mechanic, but hairdresser is always and a lot of it is our fault. A lot of it is our fault because we haven't we haven't educated ourselves. We're not bringing top-notch value to the client. You know, we used to make clients sit and wait six hours, four hours, three hours, two hours. I Eight mean, hours. I'm overbooking. You know, you have a 10 o'clock, a 10.15, a 10.30, a, a 10.45. There's no way possible that you can do five clients in one hour. There's no way possible. But that's how so we was taught. Exactly. That's part of it. That's Even by our mentors. Exactly. Exactly. Because... It's, it's kind of like, that's how they were taught. That's how they were shown because the, that's not good customer experience <laughs> to make somebody well, spend their entire day with you. Well, you know what, Kia? I'm going to have to say that I don't know because they seemed like they was enjoying it to me. <laughs> you know what? Because they didn't know no better. <laughs> we were all like just locked down in the salon. All <laughs> we held them hostage. Selling chicken, chicken platters and <laughs> fish platters and remember Miss Hurst. Remember Miss Hurst. What you say? Remember Miss Hurst that used to come around with the food. Yes. <laughs> like that was just part of the culture, and we're not really running this as a real business because we're not. It, it's 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 I don't know. It was it's crazy, but like I said before, I got introduced introduced to that at such a young. I think I was yes. nice. When I when I was an assistant and I saw that and I was just like, oh well, I guess this is how we do it. And then after some a long time, I was just like, this makes absolutely no sense. But because I exposed myself, I started yeah. exposing myself to the other side. And I started to see how white stylists operated and was, white and yeah, white crazy. And having these conversations. And I'm like, yo, I'm 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 like hustling backwards. This is really not cool. So, so can like you said, tell like the gen the younger people that's coming up, like the, well, they never worked like us. No. I mean, even when I was hiring people towards the end before I closed my big salon, hey, I was always the last one in the salon. They wasn't working crazy like us, they mm -hmm. wasn't hustling like us, but we had a certain lifestyle that we wanted to live. Right. So we hustled. We couldn't even enjoy it. Because and we were making money. We were definitely making money. But I mean, we were working like it, it, it didn't balance out. Right. Didn't balance. And, you know, after a while, when I started really educating myself, I started really understanding the difference between what we were doing in the black community versus what they were doing in the white community. Now that's not to say white, there's no white hairstylist on the planet that does that, I'm, you know, but the ones I, don't I know, know none. the ones I know do not. I don't know none. <laughs> they, they don't have a late night. Like <laughs> Thursday is the late night. We stay up until maybe nine, maybe eight. Right. The rest, the rest of the week, no, like. They had a and, life. Exactly. They had a life. And now, back to back to back to back to back knowing there's no way possible that you can give this woman excellent service in 15 you know what i want to publicly apologize to our customers yes that we held hostage <laughs> in the salon but it was like that. it was crazy we held them hostage we held them hostage. Yes. but and once so i realized it I said, I wanted to share with some of my, you know, um, 
my friends that were black hairstylists and like, you know, we've been doing this wrong. We, let me share with you what I've been learning. And some of them were like, oh, wow. You know, let me see what I can do about changing what I'm doing over on this end. And then some were like fearful. We are fearful of increasing our price. We are, we, because we have not been taught the value. We are valuable. Hairstylists are important. Hairstyles are just as important as your doctor. Yes. We care for the hair. Yes. The hair needs care too. Your skin needs care. Your dentist, your teeth need care. Your nails need care. Why don't we value the hairstylist? So it's up to us to reprogram, retrain our thinking, educate ourselves, then in turn, educate our client. And you can't force feed it to anybody. Some people are just not built like that. Like I always say, every client is not for me. Mm -hmm. Because some clients don't even value the fact that I'm going to educate them. I'm not just going to have you come to the salon and say, oh, what you getting done? Oh, okay. I'm, I'm here to teach you. I'm here to educate you. I'm here to show you how to take care of your hair. That's what a, a, a stylist does. Someone that actually cares about hair care. Right. You know, we're here to, to cater to their needs. We, we, are, we, are, we are service providers. We are servants. Right. Right. We are. But at the same time, we are valuable. And if we as stylists don't see ourselves as being valuable, the client can't see us being valuable. Right. And so now, nowadays, um, in the schools of cosmetology, we already know that it's not a curriculum. At least um, it might be now for African-American hair care or styling or anything like that. If it is, it's new. And um, so we're talking you know, decades of not teaching us, um, it had to be a gift to know how to do hair because yeah. nobody taught us how to do hair. And um, so for the generations coming up behind us, do you think that they're interested in like our way of like, not our way of doing things. Cause every, like you said the other day, we can learn from somebody that's in school. Mm -hmm. We can learn from anybody. But um, as a community, do you think that we need unity, more unity and more um, in the African-American community? Definitely. Um, yes, okay. Yeah, definitely. We definitely need more unity. We need to grab these young stylists that are in school, that are coming out of school and teach them better than what we were. Okay. Like, Do you think they would let us? Um, some will, some won't. But I think, I, I think that's not even a black thing. I think that's just the nature of humans. Some people aren't open to learn. Okay. Some people are. Um, but we really had to get them when they're coming out of school and teach them the right way that we maybe didn't learn. You know, when I, I remember, you know, in, in the past training assistants and they were like, nobody ever showed me this. Nobody ever taught me this. Like, it's amazing to me that we're not, what we're introduced to is so different than the white stylist. It, it just really is. And I know this for a fact because I'm around more white stylists than I am black stylists in what I do. How is and that? Conversations, you know, the team, I'm on a team that's predominantly white. Most of the teams I work on are predominantly white, which means if it's 25 hairstylists, I might be the only black. And how is that? How does that make you feel? Does um, that mean there's no diversity in that? It's not enough, no. I'm not gonna say it's zero, but it's very little diversity. Okay. Very. Because <laughs> some teams I'm on, it might be, like I said, let's say it's 50 stylists, it might be three black stylists. So that's not quite, diverse enough to me okay. we need to see, you know i mean we need to see some asian stylists we need to see more latinos we need to see more black stylists it should be a mix okay Our, the white stylists are, are featured on the bigger platforms on social media than the black stylists are so the whole industry just needs to be you know taken apart and put back together because we're not highlighted the way the white stylists are on these huge platforms. But that's not going to happen. 
Well, things are starting to change. You know, um, I've been, you know, I've had um, big companies reach out to me to say they want to feature me um, for diversity for their page. So I'm seeing some things shifting. We have some movers and shakers out there that are making things happen. Okay. But um, it's a slow, it's a slow process. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely not going to happen overnight. But the George Floyd murder um, catapulted a lot of this change in the beauty industry because racism is big in the beauty industry and it's obvious. It's very obvious. If you visit a lot of these pages, it's very, very obvious. And also black hairstylists support these brands. Black hairstylists pay for their education, pay for, for their classes. We jump on planes, we go to LA, we go to, um, uh, what is it called? Long Beach. We support these educators and these companies and they won't feature us. So things are changing and things need to change. So, you know, I came into the industry in 1991 and that's the year I got my license. So I think between 1991 and today, the only thing that's the same is the fact that we shampoo our hair with water. That's it. Everything else is different everything um and a lot of people are a lot of stylists are stuck in 1996 because they were like you know popping a popping stylist in 96 they were getting money and they stayed in 96 mentally you know because they didn't they did not grow they did not they didn't change they didn't evolve um they keep going back to that year and it's like but we're over this way stop right. going that so I mean, it's so much that it's just the world has changed. Yes, it has. You know, we have technology. We have technology with products and tools. And I mean, the things that were going on in, in 1993 are not happening today. So it's a whole different language going on. Right. So those stylists that didn't keep up are being left behind because they refuse. You know, we get stubborn and we're like, well, you know how it is. Well, I used to do this and it worked. Yeah, but that was 25 years ago. I mean, the industry has changed. Matter of fact, when we started this interview and we're ending this interview, 25 million changes have already happened. We are moving in a super fast paced society. Everything is moving at lightning speed. And if you're not moving that fast, you're going to get left behind. It's that cut and dry. Like I said, the only thing that's similar from 30 years ago to now in this industry to me is the fact that we shampoo hair with water. That's it. Okay. So people got to get to know like what they need to do and stuff like well, that in order. I mean, it's not, a, it's, it's not, a, it's not like a one thing. You just need to do this one thing, you know, it's a series of things it's just, you know, reevaluating yourself mm -hmm. as a person, reevaluating re your business, decide on where you want to go, how you want to grow, mm -hmm. um, figuring those things out and then implementing, you know, things to actually project what you want to do. You know, it's right. But we are so afraid of change. Like, you know, we as people, are like, oh God, change. I have to change. Oh my God, I'm going to die. I have to change. You know, we don't want to change anything. And, you know, I had to learn that too. Like we get comfortable. Who doesn't like being comfortable? I love right. being comfortable. Right. But you don't grow in your comfort zone. Right. And you don't evolve in your comfort zone. So, you know, even the funny thing is the client today is not even the same. The client today, they live on YouTube University. <laughs> so, they're being fed all of this information. They got Instagram, everything's coming at them. Boom, 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 boom. All these hairstyles, you know, everybody is, wants to wear wigs and nobody wants to take care for real hair. And, you know, they have so much information coming at them. The client that sits in your chair now is a little bit more educated than the client of 30 years ago. Right. And they're following 500 stylists that do the same thing you do. Whereas before it was word of mouth, you might have only knew, you might, you know, back in the day, you might have only known about, you know, 25 dope stylists in Philly or whatever. I just put that number out right, there. Right. But now it's like you're following stylists. And if you live in Philly, you're following them in Philly, Chicago, LA, Dallas, um, New York, 
London, Paris, China, Japan, they're all over. Right. You're finding them. Oh, I know this girl in Japan that does this. Right. So you have access to everybody now through social media, which is changing the way the customer thinks and how they shop. You know, what they're, they're being exposed to. They're exposed to the same thing. I mean, think about social media for a minute. You can follow whoever you want. It's not like hairstylists only follow hairstylists. Or, you know, clients are not allowed to follow hairstylists. Clients can follow the same hairstylist you're following. So they're being exposed to a whole lot of different things. Right. You know, so it's definitely more challenging than when we uh, came up in the industry. Um, it's a lot more if if you ever look at competition. I never did. Um, but we definitely it's a lot to to definitely. Um, it's a lot of opportunity out here for all of us. It's I always say, you know, I'm I'm competing with the kid from yesterday. I'm not focusing on all these uh, I can't because it's a lot and you get caught up it's yes so you got to worry about you and focus I focus on what I, who was I yesterday I need to be a greater kid than I was yesterday I that. know that's the truth that's and awesome clap for and clap for the other people because yes we all be dope like we can all be dope it's room for all of us it's it's money out here for everybody it's opportunity out here and what what I've learned is the more you share the more it comes to you, the more you give, the more do you get back, you know? So we have to stop being so, no, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to know. And just, cause they're going to find out anyway. <laughs> like you ain't really keeping a secret. Wow. Hey kid, know. remember back in the day when we would put our stuff in the drawer, we'd be in a salon full of other stylists, but we, what's she what using right I now? Do doing? Yeah. <laughs> and you can that's that's all the way now. It's yeah. more than shit. A lot of salon owners are like that. A lot of salon owners are they don't grow their staff, which blows my mind. I am not a salon owner. I have never wanted to be one because I'm a free spirit and I want to move when I want to. So right. being a salon owner has never been attractive to me at all. But if I was a salon owner, it's all about growing my team. Yeah, I mean, you got to grow your team. You can't just grow yourself. If you're making five thousand a week, your team needs to be making five thousand a week. And if yes. they're not, I need to figure out why they're not. Right, right. Because you're gonna make. It makes sense, right? It does. <laughs> it's just there are owners that don't do that still to this day. With all this education out here, they'll have a. You know, I mean, they may have 10 stylists in their salon, but the difference now is a lot of people, especially in Philly, I find that some of the dopest hairstylists all have their own suite or salon. And if they have a salon, they are they only employ one, maybe two other stylists. Okay. Whereas, you know, back in the day, you know, we had salons with, you know, 10 stylists and eight stylists and 15 and 20 stylists. It's different now. Because we can't seem to get on the same page. We can all, nobody wants to work for anybody. Everybody wants to be their own boss, but you ain't really bossing up because you're not growing your staff. You're not educating them. You're not taking them to the next level. Everything is about growth. Yeah, it's so as much. The leader, as the leader, you're only as good as your leader. So whoever is leading, if you're failing, the leader is responsible for that. The leader right. is responsible. It is what it is. It That's is. It. And I've been, I've taken classes on that. <laughs> it is what it is. But right. again, the white side is very different than the black side. I've worked in white salons. It's very, very different. They looking at everybody's numbers. They want growth in everything. They're, get, they're sending you new clients. It's up to you to keep it. But I, you know, I look at myself, I had to hustle on my own. You know, I had my own brand going on and I had right. to hustle on my own, but I never understood that about our side. And this is why it's important. And I say this all the time to my black stylist friends, it is important to build your network and not just build it of what you are. Mix it up. I have Asian stylist friends. 
I have, I mean, I communicate with stylists in Africa, in London, in Paris, in Japan, that I talk to on social media that I have never met in person. Well, some I did, but like the ones in Japan, I've never met. But okay. if I ever go to Japan, I'm gonna link up with them. Right. You know what I mean? It's all about networking. And I want to learn what you guys are doing. Right. But we, we, you know, we, we like to stay here and yeah. everything comfortable, but as a business, we should be growing right. as a business. Well, you know, on that note, okay, we're going to have to uh, tie up this interview, but I just want to thank you for taking the time to talk to me, talk to my audience and coming on to Clip It Real Talk. It's so much to cover in this industry. So much. And I'm telling you, I believe that God is going to use you in a mighty way. He's going to use a lot of us to just motivate, encourage, influence. You are a major influencer, a major person. And I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you so much, Juanita. Thank you so much for having me on this platform. Thank you for creating it because it's so necessary. I love seeing Black artists doing their thing and growing their brand. So I applaud you for doing this because this thank is you. amazing. I'm <laughs> loving thank you, Kia. And I tell you, thank you for, I'm going to tell you, thank you, audience. Thank you to my viewers. You do not want to miss this phenomenal lady. Everything that she has done is turning to gold. She is phenomenal and thank powerful. You powerful with wisdom and knowledge and with i just tell you I to learned the hard way. Huh? i learned the hard way we all have <laughs> <That's me. laughs> i finally figured it out <laughs> and i applaud you girl i applaud you i take my hat off to you girl Thank i you. really do Thank please don't forget to subscribe don't forget to ring the bell and spread the good news all of kia's information her Instagram page, her website, whatever information that she has is going to be down in the caption. If you have any questions, just ask the questions and I'll get back to you. But thanks again for tuning in to Clip It Real Talk. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.